For this second introductory lecture, we're going to be starting off talking a little bit about the ge geographic approach and themes in geography. And we're starting off with a image taken from space that's looking down on the landscape. And I would ask the viewers to look at this image and think about what you see. Are there any features that you can identify or figure out what it is that you're looking at? And I would just remind you that uh, human features tend to have regular straight lines and geometric shapes, natural features um, not so much. And so you can see this area down here, clearly human activity uh, up in the area to the north, uh, not so much. And um, as we sort of piece things together, we might be able to determine that there's this white features on the land. Uh, you might be thinking snow, but uh, an additional clue is that there are actually shadows that are found next to these, which actually tells me these are clouds. You can see that uh, there is a apparent um, symmetrical feature here. This turns out to be a mountain peak. And we can further describe this location. This is Mindanao Island. Uh, and an image of what that looks like on the ground. We get a sense of a more traditional form of agriculture here, the use of a water buffalo, beast of burden, as opposed to mechanized equipment. You see palm trees in the background, which might tell you that this is a tropical environment. We could take a look at a map of this particular uh, somewhat unusual shaped island gives us a little bit more information about uh, what we're looking at. And we could zoom our way out a little bit and see this place in context. You can see its proximity to China, Hong Kong. Uh, it's actually part of the Philippine island chain. And if we put in a little bit more context, we could see that it's a little bit north of the equator. Indeed, we can attach a location to it in the form of latitude and longitude. 8.1 degrees north latitude, 120.86 degrees east longitude, east of the prime meridian, north of the equator. And this is uh, an example of applying the five themes of physical geography, actually um, any study of geography will incorporate these themes. Um, the first is human environment, or human environment interactions, followed by location, place, the unique descriptors of a particular locale, movement, and finally region. And I've provided you with a mnemonic device to help you remember this. Help more. Here we see descriptions of the themes in geographic science, location, both absolute and relative, place, movement, human environment interactions, and region. And we'll be talking a little bit more about region here in a few moments. So we'll take this opportunity to expand on this discussion a little bit. There's Mindanao Island, and we're going to talk a little bit about the country of Indonesia as a case study of, of sorts. can see some of the major islands that constitute this island nation, which include Borneo Island, which is the third largest island in the world, New Guinea Island, which is the second largest island in the world. And this location has a number of unique characteristics, including being home to the famed Coral Triangle that has some of the highest diversity of marine species centered around coral reefs that are found anywhere in the world. 
And of course, there's unique cultural aspects to this region. We see on this religions map that uh, there's both modern and traditional Islam practice, but also Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, and Buddhism. This is also an area that is uh, within the tropics, so we are in a belt of tropical rainfall, which is defined by the Intertropical Convergence Zone, or the ITCZ, which we'll talk about more later in the course. So I wanted to share a little of our study abroad Global Expedition Program in 2016. And in this program, we're applying field work and jungle skills in the interest of biodiversity conservation. And we are practicing physical geography in the field, gathering data, exploring and investigating the conditions of these high-value locations. And we're also practicing human geography in the field, getting acquainted with local customs and the populations that reside in these places. This is an extension of work that I've done for a number of years uh, on the island of Borneo, and here's some of my old friends and collaborators um, that we've worked with here at the Center for Renewable Energy and Appropriate Technology, where they are developing solar and uh, micro hydro thermal power to support local communities. Their instructor on the right hand si side of the screen. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about world regions and realms. Uh, and we've just come from Southeast Asia, which is the 10th of the world realms that are defined by your author that are the basis of the chapters in the textbook and our week-to-week -week study of the world regions. A clarification on terminology, the textbook uses the term realm to describe the broadest classification of Earth's surface. And then within those realms, we will talk about individual regions. So for example, if we're talking about the, re the realm of North America, we'll see that there are five or six regions that are found within that realm. That being said, you're instructor will often refer to world regions in the context of the map that you see here as effectively realms are simply super regions. The same essential concept. In the study of regions in geography we distinguish two types of regions. The first and most prominent, most common type of region is the formal region and formal regions possess a degree of uniformity and internal interaction. And so here we see agricultural regions of the United States with examples including the Corn Belt, the Gulf Subtropical Belt as being two examples of uniform or formal regions for agriculture in the United States. By contrast, functional regions are regions that are networked or connected with other places and focused around a core. Last time we talked about the concept of core periphery relationships. So in effect, this functional region connects the core with its periphery, most oftentimes by a network of roads or railroad lines, maybe communication lines. And so rather than having distinct boundaries, these networked functional regions tend to have a spider configuration to them as we have some connectivity between the core area here represented by central Los Angeles 
and that will connect outlying areas. You can see the different outlying areas that are defined here uh, for the Los Angeles area. Generally speaking, these functional regions will be urban areas. Okay, last time we talked about the fact that spatial concepts are used to describe and understand areas. This is a fundamental aspect of geography, and so some of the concepts and terms that will be used in the spatial realm are distribution, area, proximity, isolation, accessibility, relationship, interactions, and movement. Again, last time we talked about geospatial technologies and maps being fundamentals to the geographer's toolbox, and I will be providing a variety of examples of these as we go through the course, but many of you have experience, no doubt, using interactive maps. This is an online geographic information system that shows us country population data from 2015 from the United Nations. And we can use this data to uh, zoom in on particular parts of the world. And we can also click on individual features, and in this case, uh, find out what the population of China was in 2015, 1.3 billion people, almost 1.4 billion and then compare that figure with 1950, which was a little over half a billion people, 500 million people in the year 1950. And then we include other information. Here's a graph of population growth. Again, we could contrast that with India. You see a very steep growth that India has experienced uh, with only slightly smaller population than China, one that will surpass China in the decades to come. Again, by contrast, we could look at Russia, much po smaller population with only 143 million people, uh, but interestingly, a growth curve that shows a distinct downward trend in recent decades. Again, we can look at data for a particular year, and this illustrates the interactive and data-rich quality of geospatial technologies, their ability to manipulate data, to change the way in which we view data is where much of the power comes in being able to better understand and analyze what is happening geographically in the world. Okay, again, just a um, reminder, we have a study abroad program that is going to go to Guyana this year. You can see the dates, and we now have a March 1st application deadline, so if this is something that you're interested in, you can hyperlink from this page, and the Student Services Department at Shasta College, the Student Life Center, can give you information. I'm more than happy to field questions if anybody's interested in learning a little bit more about our study abroad program. You'll see a few review questions, fill in the terms. These are practice questions that I've provided you in support of your graded review questions that you will take on Canvas this week. And all of these will be in your reading and in your textbook. That's the end of our review of the Introduction to World Regional Geography. We'll see you online.